financial independence, country shopping, van nomadism, security culture, ethical enclaves, crypto anarchy, legal interstices, survivalism. Join your host Shane and Kyle as they explore this freedom strategy known as Vaughn. You're listening to the Vani Podcast. And welcome to the Vani Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to coercion. Or as close as you can be, at least. <laughs> I'm Shane, and... I'm Kyle. Ooh, the deep voice. Are you trying to get sexy on us? I was trying to say, I'm Batman. But I was I'm trying Batman. to say, I'm Kyle. I don't know, did that work? Well, it didn't. It didn't necessarily work. But if that if that was the <laughs> if that was you know the, the the goal that you were aiming for, then uh, then I would say there's a good example we'll go into here momentarily in this so, podcast. So just so just to be clear, I'm not. I'm Batman. I'm Kyle. So Kyle is not Batman, guys. If you if you're, if you're <laughs> unaware, but uh, anyways, uh, we're certainly glad you decided to join us today, and uh, we hope things have been uh, things have been good on your end, and that uh, you know uh, the coercion has not uh, commenced upon you. Uh, at, at all that would be a uh, very very negative <laughs> so what uh, kind why don't you go ahead and uh, bipcot this thing for us since governments are the primary coercers upon individuals the vanu podcast is covered by a bipcod no government license reuse and modification is permitted to anyone except for governments and the agents thereof you can learn more at bipcot.org thank you very much i appreciate your service sir <laughs> Uh, I bet, whatever. That's fun. <laughs> so th this episode is entitled Mean Time to Harassment, Gauging Your Success at Vanu. And the show notes can be found at vanupodcast.com forward slash 10. For this one, you will definitely want to visit the show notes so that you can open up the graph we'll be discussing here tonight. We will try to do our best in presenting the information audibly, but sooner or later, you must look at the graph or else the concept of mean time to harassment is just not going to make any sense. So yeah, we say you must... Uh, because uh, not because we're authoritarians, but uh, if you want to understand the concept, you, you, you need to go there and, and at least check out the graph uh, so, so you can understand what the hell we're talking about. So, as always, Kyle, Mr. Definition Man, actually not always, one time I did it. Maybe, you know, next week I'll, I'll, I'll do it uh, for me. But uh, anyways, uh, let's, let's, go, let's get into some definitions. So what, what is mean time to harassment? It's the strength of Vanu, and it's expressed usually in terms of years. So mean time to harassment, MTH for short, is typically used to gauge what I guess you could call the profitable viability of concealing a venuum, venuum being a, a place or situation of uh, invulnerability coercion, of concealing a venuum relative to one's competency at vanumi, uh, the art of being skilled in, uh, in of basically the invulnerability to coercion. So to say that again, MTH is typically used to gauge the profitable viability of concealing a venuum relative to one's competency at vanumi. So if you were to kind of put this in maybe slightly different language, all MTH is is gauging the efficacy of the vanu strategy itself. So, mm -hmm. so, so yeah, like much like with other forms of direct action or on Elieway's direct action series where questions of efficacy came up regarding various different uh, tactics, techniques, methods, and strategies of one flavor or another, well, Vanu has its own gauge of efficacy. It's MTH. It is. It is. And, and it, you know, I think this, 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 this further adds credibility to Vanu because – you know, a lot of these. Uh, I mean, you, you did your uh, your first first book on on why reformism doesn't work. Essentially, you know, uh, political crusading, and uh, you know, people are, are continuing to use failed strategies, uh, even though the efficacy is is, is nil or none. Uh, like it, 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 these strategies do not work, but people continue using them. Uh, but Rayo, you know, back in the sixties or seventies when he was formulating this strategy, uh, it, it's very very comprehensive, as we said before. And uh, this is another, you know, more proof of that. He he kind of. Uh, you know, headed off any, uh, you know, headed off uh, anything that, uh, you know, Kyle might have done in the future uh, as far as, you know, uh, <laughs> disproving the efficacy of, of various strategies. So there's uh, so he kind of, uh, you know, laid out a a, a, a way to, uh, you know, gauge your efficacy of Vanu. Yes, exactly. And so I think I think that's something to kind of to kind of really consider in terms of people's seriousness is that if they if they want to encourage people to do something, there's got to be a way of of measuring. I hate to say measuring progress, but let's just say 
measuring efficacy. You know, does this... Per- okay, I'm going to get praxeological on everybody, okay? Human action is purposeful behavior. All right, so men, acting men, utilize means in order to achieve ends. Okay, so that's that's for everybody who's more of a rationalist. Now for everyone else who's more of an empiricist, now the question is, okay, since we have acting men in the world trying to achieve goals by using means, how effective have certain means been at achieving certain goals relative to others, and especially relative to others, or even on its own merits? And so all MTH is doing is just measuring the efficacy of Vanu based on its own uh, principles and precepts and so forth. So just to repeat the definition again, because maybe not everybody got that the first time, because MTH is so incredibly important. One more time. Mean time to harassment is the strength of Vanu, usually expressed in years. It's typically used to gauge the profitable viability of concealing a venuum, the place or situation of an invulnerability to coercion, relative to one's competency at Vanumi, the art of achieving an invulnerability to coercion. Okay, everybody get that? The profitable <laughs> viability, the profit, one more time, the profitable viability of concealing a venuum relative to one's competency at Vanumi. Okay, that's the definition of mean time and harassment. If you understand this, then the rest of the episode, you can, you can, you know, it'll start making sense as we go through the details. Yes, and as, as you mentioned, it's, it's extremely, extremely crucial uh, to Vanu. This was what closed out section one, if I remember correctly. No, I think, yeah, it was, it was the last, uh, it was the last or second to last chapter. Uh, in part one, uh, incredibly, incredibly important. It kind of laid out, uh, you know, it, it kind of gave, it, it, it provided, you know, the the you know, the gauging of efficacy for the, you know, part two. Uh, so yeah, if you understand that, uh, then then you're going to be well off for the rest of this uh, for the rest of this podcast. Uh, so let's actually look at what Rayo said. Quote: Occasionally, especially when some project isn't going too well, I ask myself, can G and I achieve Vanu for Vanu to be attractive on more than an experimental basis? Or have we reached a point of diminishing returns beyond which a vast effort will yield only a small improvement? Improvement. To conceptualize this better, I made the following graph. The vertical, vertical axis represents Vanu, expressed in terms of mean time to harassment, MTH. Each vertical unit is approximately a 10 times increase in MTH. The horizontal axis represents amount of activity, also difficulty of concealment. End quote. May 1973 was when this article was written, page 25. Uh, so let me just kind of, you know, lo- t- read those axes again. So the vertical axis represents Vanu, expressed in terms of mean time to harassment. Each vertical unit is approximately a 10 times increase in MTH. The horizontal axis represents amount of activity, also difficulty of concealment. Uh, so, I mean, that kind of, uh, I-, I think actually, Kyle, I'll just go ahead and read the second one too, because that'll also, you know, provide some further audible clarification on uh, what the hell this this graph consists of. So, Quote, the diagonal lines represent lines of capability one order of magnitude ten times apart. Six years ago in 1967, when I was becoming seriously interested in Vanu, but had little experience, my competence was roughly represented by line A. Three years ago, after experience with living in a van, competence had increased to line B. Today, our competence level is approximated by C. Thus, at present, we can choose among the following. A small tent, adequate for summer only, in a remote place with 100 years MTH, a larger tent and more equipment and supplies in a place with year-round access, and a 10-year MTH to the larger tent is also more visible, end quote. Uh, So May, that's, uh, that was the same one, May 1973, page 27. So, uh, Kyle, anything there? Actually, I'm I'm looking at this now, and... Okay, okay, something I kind of want to stress to everybody. I know it was said a moment ago, I'm going to say it again. If, for you listeners, if you don't have the graph pulled up, do it. Otherwise, your only other option, especially for those of you who are commuting, is you're going to have to like somehow visually like look at this. So before you know, you get in your car or your motorcycles or whatever the hell else you used to get to work or whatever, at least glance at the chart if you can't exactly look at it while you listen to this episode, because this entire episode is based on one chart. <laughs> okay, so you have vertical lines, you have horizontal lines, you have diagonal lines, and then of course there's also the curve of profitable viability. It depends which side of the curve you're on because one side of the curve is where, well, where the viability is profitable and then there's the other side of the curve where the where the where where there is not any sort of viable profitability. So there's a graph. It's not particularly complex, but there, but there are some elements going on. Vertical lines, horizontal lines, diagonal lines, and then a curve. And you need to actually 
if you're not going to stare at it while you're listening to us, you at least need to visualize it if, if you've got like a good, you know, strong memory or whatever. Uh, but but obviously, me personally, I like to like have I, I like to have the book open while I'm, you know, look, trying to understand things, especially for the first time. So that being said, uh, Rayo was being rather quite serious here in, try, in terms of trying to measure the efficacy of his own strategy, wasn't he, Shane? Yeah, even more so than than we really were in the direct action series. I mean, we didn't come up with any like uh, charts or graphs or visual aids or anything like that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so so yeah, he was he was very very serious. He, yeah, he drew up a he drew up a damn graph. Uh, so so yeah, uh, get that open, get that open, and yeah, we're gonna repeat some stuff in this one because it's important for the folks who aren't looking at this. We're, we're you know we're we're gonna be nice to them uh, since of course we're gonna be nice to them. Um, and also for you folks that do have it open, you know, a little, uh, a little, you know, reiteration is, is is always, almost always a good thing, especially here in, in this context. So let me read this this next one, and uh, that'll provide some some further clarification here. Quote: Within the shaded area, Vanu is not likely worthwhile. I.e., total cost of being Vanu will usually exceed the total benefits. The boundary between the viable and non-viable situation slopes downwards to the left, at least under present conditions. This is because, one, the lower levels of activity require much less equipment, and thus a higher probability of confisca confiscation is, is acceptable. Number two, the lower levels of activity are less suspicious and thus unlikely to lead to serious loss, even if discovered. End quote. Uh, and we'll go on to this, uh, this next one here, which is a, 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 occurs a page later. With our present capability, line C, we really aren't able to enjoy a comfortable home the year-round in Bivanu. So long as we have sea level capability, we can trade off between increasing Vanu and increasing activity. But increasing both requires more capability. Sea level Vanu is attractive, except in a disaster survival situation, only to experimenters in Vanu, pioneers, who are interested in Vanu for its own sake. Our present capability at Vanu has limited usefulness. Most people prefer a comfortable home that is relatively non Vanu to Spartan survival with relative Vanu. A minimum level of D-level capability is necessary for Vanu to be attractive to many people other than experimenters. E-level is probably minimum for development of much of an alternative economy worthy of the name, end quote. So he's laying out these, these different levels of Vanu, and don't worry, we're going to get into that. So if, if, you, if it's kind of going over your head, even if you have the graph open, just... It went over, it's, it's still kind of, I mean, we'll get to this later on, but uh, um, there's actually a screw up whenever, whenever the article is written. But we, yeah, we'll get more into that. We're, we're, still tr we're, we're trying to figure these things out as we're kind of going along. Uh, so if this doesn't make sense to you yet, don't worry. <laughs> just don't worry. Uh, any, anything on that, Kyle, or, uh, uh, you know, just kind of get through these last two uh, paragraphs and we can chat. Yeah, let's let's get through the last two paragraphs because, of course, I, I think it's good to kind of lay out what Rayo said, and then we'll need to kind of go through and really kind of break this down because this entire episode is based not only on the concept of MTH, but also Rayo's chart. So, yeah, let's just keep going with this right now. Cool. Okay. Quote, My present expectations are that G and I can possess to level D primarily by refining present techniques, living mostly above ground and importing most supplies. Progressing beyond D will probably require fully underground shelters and new access techniques. During the past six years, we made plenty of mistakes which slowed us down. There was no one we knew of to teach us, so there was much trial and error. Today, we could probably guide an inexperienced but highly motivated person, which I was six years ago, to our present level in a year or less. End quote. Uh, the next one, a page later, quote, Vanuists disagree about whether one should first see greater activity or greater MTH. Some believe that the neophyte should first try to build a large and profitable but non-Vanu conventional business than attempt to Vanu it. Evidence is inconclusive, but I believe the opposite approach is much more promising. Become Vanu at a relatively low level of activity, then attempt to increase activity while maintaining or increasing Vanu. Points. The more people involved and the more interactions with that society, the more difficult any change of lifestyle. A non-Vanu enterprise is apt to have little in common with a Vanu enterprise. Experience gained during the former will probably not be particularly helpful when doing the latter. End quote. So yeah, essentially, uh, what what Ray was saying there in that last paragraph is uh, some people have argued that you know it's good to uh, you know uh, start a business and become rich, uh, you know before before Vanu, and then you know actually turn that business uh, you know uh, uh, into into Vanu as well. Uh, now, in regards to financially independent early retirement, you know if I, you start a massive business and you do well and you can sell that. Uh, you'll probably be Vanu a lot faster than some other folks. But, uh, you know, maintaining a, a non-Vanu business, 
uh, you know, when, in, in your vanilla, it's probably not a good idea. Probably not a good idea. And that's kind of what Ray was emphasizing there. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's kind of like it, it's it's kind of like the equivalent of trying to use security culture techniques after you've already given up uh, some elements of your privacy. You know, it, it's it's kind of like you know there there really is a notion of you know too little too late. There really is the notion of you know putting the cart before the horse at least to some extent. You know, it's it's just kind of like no, if you're gonna go for invulnerability, you have to do it kind of like at the beginning. OK, it's kind of and security culture works very similarly. Right. If you're going to care about your right to privacy when it comes to certain things, some of the most important stuff you'll do is actually right at the beginning. And, um, you know, I've had to learn the hard way, you know, uh, when it comes to certain privacy techniques, I've done some stuff right and I've done some stuff incorrectly and I've had to pay uh, not always in money, but in other ways for incorrectly uh, using some uh, privacy techniques, mainly due to incompetence at the time and so forth. So with regards to Vanu, uh, yeah, if you don't do certain things, you know, more or less correctly, or at least along that spectrum of, of correctness and in, in the sense of actually doing it consistently uh, in the spirit of the thing of, of trying to pursue an invulnerability to coercion, um, it's going to bite you. So trying to somehow turn a non-Vanu conventional, or as the Agoras would call it, a white market business into either a gray or even a black market business is really just kind of silly. I mean, that doesn't even make any damn sense. Yeah, and then, and then also there too, like uh, let's say you're an, you're an entrepreneur with a small business. I mean, you, you build up your client base, and you know they're going to be of the status of all society. Uh, it's not going to do much good to you know relocate that to, like to to non to to a volume business anyways because you can't advertise uh, you can't like you know put an advertisement on the radio uh, <laughs> or anything like that so you're going to lose that clientele once you go volume so uh, right. at, least, at least most of them so yeah it doesn't doesn't make a whole lot of sense right and and not to go on too long about this but just to kind of round out the point you know if you're a small business owner and you quote unquote employ other people in your white market business and you do things like withholding you know for federal income tax purposes and you collect the social uh, socialist insecurity taxes and you bow down and get a, whatever licenses and whatever else because of all the regulations whether by OSHA or you know pick a government entity of the federal government or the several state governments etc 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 by the time you've done all that stuff you've already chosen carefully calculated submission and that's on a good day because a lot of people don't even do the carefully calculated part they just submit blindly but of those of you who consci who conscientiously chose that for whatever reason, you can't like undo it after the fact. The only way to really kind of move forward, and at least in some sense, would be kind of like start over again. You know, sell. You know, much Shane, you said it a moment ago. Sell off that business and then do a different one. Be an entrepreneur for once, right? You know, sell or off that be, business. Be, be an entrepreneur again if you have your own business now. Yeah, <laughs> if you did right. it once, you might be able to do it again. Only this time, just this will be a volume business, not. Uh, not one, you know, designed for the state of survival society. So, so essentially, what what Ray was getting at here was, uh, rather than you know, uh, you know, taking that as we kind of said, taking that business from Vanu to non Vanu, uh, you know, start at a at a low level activity, you know, utilize the import export that we discussed in the in the last episode, and then uh, uh, you know, once once you can once you you get better, uh, and you you become more uh, proficient, then you can start making those decisions as far as you know how much activity you can uh, you can you can do. Uh, while still maintaining or increasing Vanu. Uh so that that's kind of what Ray was getting at here. But I want to I want to get into you know explaining MTH more because this is interesting as all hell to me, uh, and I'm I'm sure it is for you too. So on this chart there are there are, let's see six types of structures, seven types of structures. The math skills are, are are null and void. I went to government schools, guys. Yeah, they're on the horizontal part of the graph. Yes, yes. So there's summer survival, all weather survival, comfortable home. Small workshop or laboratory, small manufacturing, light industry, heavy industry. So next, we'll kind of give you uh, some examples of the years, which this would be on the um, this would be on the uh, on, on the vertical axes. You know, as far as the uh, the the time of Vanu, the the degree of Vanu and MTH, as per the chart. So one year MTH. A level summer, and this is the the, the letter A, like uh, A B A level, B level, C level, D level. A level summer survival and B level all weather survival. Ten year MTH, 
C level, all weather survival, D level, comfortable home, E level, small workshop, laboratory, and F level, small manufacturing. 100 year MTH, G level, small manufacturing, and H level, light industry. So, so Kyle was what what he was getting at here, I think, and and, and I guess this is more of a question. So was was he getting at like the the, the more intense the, the I guess yeah it is the more activity. So the more activity that uh, will be there, um, and this this is the part I'm kind of I, I kind of get confused at. So so the more activity, obviously small level manu or uh, small manufacturing and high, and uh, light industry will be uh, you know more activity, uh, but that's more years. Is that saying uh, you know like uh, it would take longer to make that viable. Is that kind of what he's getting across there? With more activity, you have lower MTH. Okay, so that's why, for example, let's take a really, really simple example, okay? Uh, like with the summer survival, all right? So the reason why the MTH, even with a lower diagonal line of competency, why you would have, let's say, um, okay, let's take something really, really simple. So if you have C-level uh, competency at Vonumi uh, and you're only doing summer survival, that's why you have 100 years MTH as opposed to all-weather survival. Again, still C-level competency because I'm trying to keep this simple. Even with C-level competency and you're doing all-weather survival, but it's your, your MTH has now been reduced down to 10 years. So notice even with that very simple example, you've increased your activity from summer survival to all-weather survival. Your competency has stayed the same in my example of just C level, but your, you know, but your, uh, but your MTH has been just chopped up by another, uh, been reduced by a factor of ten, right? Oh, From okay, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. So, so that makes sense. So, if your if your comp competency level is higher, uh, and, and yeah, again, like if you're doing, you know, C level, uh, you know, summer survival, your proficiency is better, and therefore you have, uh, I mean, I, I think you kind of mentioned, you know, longer time to like being discovered. Uh, so like, mm -hmm. uh, so for that one, you know, like a hundred years would be, would be the MTH for that one. So yeah, that, okay. That does make sense. So if you're, so when you increase, yeah, okay. Yeah. So when you increase activity, but let's say your competency stays the same, you increase your activity, your MTH goes down. It actually is an inverse relationship. So the only way to really develop much of anything is of course you have to increase competency. So if you have a level competency, you need to get to B level, B level to C level to D level, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. OK, so the only way that you can really increase your activity, increasing the scope of your venuum, is by increasing your competency and thus your MTH will actually be halfway decent. And therefore, you, you stay in that um, area of, of profitable viability. And those examples you read just a little bit ago about, um, like, for example, one year MTH, A level summer survival and B level all-weather survival, those were different examples of the minimum profitable viability of concealing a venuum relative to one's competency at Vonumi. Okay, so those are the minimums. So for those people who um, were never, let's say, much like I said in the last episode and even in other episodes, like I was a Boy Scout, right? So for those of you people who were never Boy Scouts or even Girl Scouts, right? We, we were promoting equality, right? Side joke. <laughs> Okay, so for those of you who are never, like, uh, any experience in the outdoors, right, even if you were just, like, garden variety backpackers or something, right, um, and other outdoor activities, uh, canoeing and so forth, if you've never had any actual real practical experience, your, your competency is going to be a lot lower. And I would also say, similarly, if you don't have very good security culture as another skill set, your competency is also going to be a lot lower, too. And what, like whatever other set of skills do you need to have? I would even say entrepreneurial skills of one kind or another. Well, if you're not very good at that, well, then your competency is also going to be a lot lower, especially when it comes to um, import-export, okay? That's just a reality of the situation. So if you want to increase your MTH and increase your activity, the only solution, according to the notion of mean time and harassment, which is what this episode is about, the only way to do it is to increase your competency, period. End of story. That's really what Rayo was kind of getting at here. And then he was just trying to more kind of gauge the kind of sliding spectrum of how to conceive of these things. Indeed, indeed. And yeah, you know, I and I'll be honest with the listeners. I, and I know uh, Kyle uh, I mentioned your screw up once. Uh, <laughs> I mentioned probably a couple times in this episode. But, yeah, you know, I'm still trying to wrap my head around MTH, honestly. 
Uh, so obviously, maybe maybe I'm not the guy to, to you know inform me on this. But but anyways, uh, Kyle Kyle wrote that article on it, and uh, uh, he he understands it better than I do. But but anyways, I mean, again, we're we're, we're kind of you know <laughs> tr- trying to you know bring this back at you know out you know out of the coffin and uh, you know and promote the, this action again. So. Uh, we're we're gonna screw up sometimes, uh, you know, for, like, especially with MTH for for a lot of this stuff. I mean, uh, for for like the for a lot of season one, it's it's pretty simple. But when we start getting into the into the action portion, uh, I would you know expect some more mistakes because uh, yeah, we're we're trying to a lot of this is just you know it's just kind of a deduction, right, Kyle? You know, kind of uh, what what Rayo said, and then kind of you know extrapolating beyond that. So just want to yeah. kind of toss that in there, and uh, uh, so so do not feel bad if at this point. Uh, you know, you don't understand MTH much. We're running down this episode, though, so I guess it might, might be too early to say that. Uh, but anyways, let, let's get into, uh, let, let's provide some examples of, you know, levels of competency here, okay? So A level would be like uh, wilderness survival, okay? Uh, B level, bugging out. Uh, and Kyle, you you know more about that than, than I do. What, what, if mm-hmm. people don't know what bugging out is, what, what, would, that, what would that be? <laughs> well, actually, hold on. Let, let's mention wilderness survival first because the two are actually kind of related. So wilderness survival, uh, and it's not just the prepper types, but also, well, the Boy Scouts and just outdoorsy people, even, even you know, combat veterans, right, will have wilderness survival training. This is basically where you're just out in, um, let's say, rural areas or actual wilderness. Not much difference between the two in some sense. And you don't have logistical lines of support, right? There's no gas stations, there's no restaurants, there's no grocery stores, there's no electrical grid really to speak of, there's no plumbing. So uh, going to the bathroom and all that just to keep this uh, family friendly to some degree. Okay, you get the point. So, and, and not only that, but this is about as raw as it gets. So that also means no tents either, ladies and gentlemen. No tents. You're probably not going to have a backpack more likely than not. You might at most have a fanny pack and that's on a good day. But generally presume you're pretty pretty much going to have the clothes in your back and whatever you could fit in your pockets. And now you get to live outside. Okay. And, it's and also known as being homeless. To, yeah, and just to, to kind of add to kind of add something in here, which would why this would be A level, uh correct me if I'm wrong, but it would be because there's less like there's less to discover. If you have a tent, uh that's easier to see uh and without the proper competency uh, then, then yeah, your 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 MTH should be low, and probably, uh, you know, kind of laying out kind of the example that you did, uh, probably be in the area of non viability. Uh, so if it's just you, the clothes on your back, and whatever you can scrounge in your pockets, uh, that's pretty much what you what you have. So you can you know be very mobile and, uh, you know, at least still have you know some positive degree of uh, mean time to harassment. Yeah, and let me let me actually actually extrapolate this out a little bit more, make this a little bit more concrete. So for the uh, prepper type people, you'll know what I'm going to say right now. Uh, it's basically just your EDC. Okay, it's your first line gear, and maybe second line gear like a vest or a fanny pack, but that's really pushing. A lot of people are not going to be wearing that a lot of time. So that's why that's, I said it's pretty much going to be your pockets. And that would be everyday carry for those who don't know the the acronym. Yes, you're pretty much going to be, it's pretty much EDC and not really much else. I mean, it could be debatable on second line gear, like a fanny pack or a vest or something, but you're not going to be having a bag, okay? There's no backpack involved. This, I mean, you talk about minimalism. Some people like minimalism a lot. This is really minimalist, okay? In literally the extreme. We're talking about like people who get lost in the woods kind of thing and they don't have a backpack, okay? Or whatever else. And another example of this maybe not wilderness part of the survival but like people who are homeless homeless people actually would have a level competency if you think about it because they're actually doing it now obviously a lot of people choose not to do that or there's there's other issues which we need not go into here but in terms of just conceptualizing this in a concrete way homeless people would have a level competency okay fair enough yeah yeah now to bugging out Generally speaking, you're going to have, again, to go to use the prepper language or whatever, generally speaking, you're going to have at least second line gear and you're definitely, or at least you should have your third line gear. Third line, of course, being your backpack, your your bug out bag and so forth. Uh, 72 hour kit or actually better than a 72 hour kit. You're going to have something that's going to sustain you for at least a week, week and a half, preferably two weeks if you can haul like 50 pounds on your back without buckling under. Okay. Because you're in good physical, because you have good physical fitness, because that's just a reality of the situation. Okay. If you can't live outside for two weeks, ideally, then yeah, you're kind of doing it wrong, at least in some sense. 
Um, you know, some people have certain preferences. Some people want to have larger backpacks. They don't have to like forge as much. Other people want to go more ultra light, so called, and they want to rely more on forging. That's arguably a personal choice, but without getting too much into the more prepper kind of material, I'll just simply say this. B-level competency in terms of MTH is more along the lines of bugging out. So you may have a tent. Some people prefer um, rain flies with the so-called footprints. Other people prefer ponchos. Other people prefer stringing up... um, you know, canvas cloths with like a, a, like a, what's it called? Like a frame. Some people call it a frame tent. It's not really a tent. It's just a tarp. Okay. Like a tarp mm-hmm. with grommets in it with like, like um, rope and, and all that that you like string to trees or whatever. Uh, some people, you can actually freestand it with hiking sticks, actually. Again, I don't want to get too technical about that. I just want to provide some concrete examples really quickly here. But yeah, bugging out, that's pretty much B level competency. So you have some degree of gear, but you're not going to have a friggin' car. <laughs> okay. No, that ain't B level. Uh uh-uh. uh. No cars. No cars, no gas, no nothing. Uh, as far as that stuff goes, you pretty much have yourself, you have your clothes, you have your pockets, you have your second, you should have second line gear, and then definitely more likely than not third line gear. So basically, B level competency is you're basically but pretty much a backpacker with a gun. Okay. And that's pretty much it. Very good. Very good. And C level uh, would be something like uh, like van dwelling. Uh, and the reason this is sea level, uh, and this is something that Rayo discussed, uh, <laughs> uh, it, it takes a higher competency. Uh, it just, I mean, it just does. You're you're going to be in a, you know, in a, in a, in a vehicle, and you're probably going to travel on public roads, uh, and therefore you're going to have to be, you know, uh, better at uh, <laughs> better at uh, concealment and deception. Uh, so so the so as you can kind of see from from kind of this kind of going from wilderness survival to bugging out to van dwelling, the more comfortable you become is whenever your competency increases. Would you say that's correct, Kyle? Yes, and also something else I kind of want to point out here, arguably uh, legal interstices start becoming at least begrudgingly relevant with sea level, right, with the van dwelling, uh, the van nomadism, as Rayo himself called it, right? So when it, when you have, like, if if you're basically homeless or wilderness survival, and or you're bugging out. Do you really need a driver's license for that? Did, I mean, do you really need? I mean, some people like cell phones or radios, but technically that's not a legal interstice, is it? Uh, hmm. You know, do you, oh, let me put it this way. Do you really need a passport for bugging out? I mean, unless you're going to bug out in the, in the sense of country shopping, but then shouldn't you have done that a lot earlier, though, before? Anyway, the point being, though, is that when you get to sea level, legal, interstar- legal interstice, you start becoming a an element you at least need to consider. Maybe not necessarily use. That's that's getting now we're getting into that's getting kind of in the issue of like, what should you do the carefully um, calculated submission and so forth? The point is that that's where it starts becoming relevant. Other than that, uh, C level would be yes, you now have a car, a car or a van or a truck, basically a device with an internal combustion engine, a chassis, and four wheels <laughs> that may or may not have a roof. I mean, some people like convertibles for whatever reason. I don't know if you people would really want to like live in that in a convertible, but I don't know. Maybe some people would be li- along those lines. And the point is that yeah, now you're involving things like. Um, now the issue of like the right to travel infringements also become kind of relevant to some degree. The tax money, gasoline taxes, that becomes relevant. Wasn't relevant when you were bugging out and being homeless. But now it's relevant with it with sea level, at least to some extent, unless you can figure a workaround around that. So again, not to belabor the point here, it's just simply that with sea level, things get really complicated real quickly. And you're we're not even talking about having a home yet. This is just like having a friggin' car. Yes. Yes, and uh, I'll just kind of posit that yeah, th- these are examples of e- of each level, and obviously this can be developed. And uh, when you know, kind of uh, Rhea provided some of these examples in his book that was in the '60s and '70s. So you know, maybe as per technology, uh, you know, it's it's possible. I mean, we we haven't even explored the uh, season two and season three yet. So sure, there there could be some possibilities uh, that that we haven't you know thought of yet, or that you know we just haven't gone into where you know A level and B level and C level could be more comfortable than they were. Uh, when 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 you know Rayo was around, so I I don't want to scare a lot of some of these things. You know, wilderness survival and bugging out uh, may may be unattractive to, to some folks, uh, but that shouldn't you know scare you or deter you away from Vanu. 
Uh, these are, you know, just examples that we, we kind of put down to, to kind of give you an idea of, of, of the various levels that are involved in, in mean time to harassment. Uh, so uh, uh, anything there, Kyle, or uh, uh, should we move forward to uh, DE and F? I would just say this. Um, for people who may want to learn more about um, being more mobile, in a sense, also to consider this. Maybe some degree of country shopping might be considered some degree of sea level, arguably. Again, we'll, we'll, we'll deal with country shopping, you know, in season two, but, you know, that's kind of interesting, right? So there, again, notice with these first three levels, it's all mobility based, if you, if you notice, by the way. You're all mobile constantly. You're on, like, homeless people don't stay in the same place, right? The very notion of bugging out is inherently mobile, and van nomadism is, well, still pretty mobile, right? And that yes, and, and 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 mobility was very very important to Rayo. And you know the the, the, the when when you move all the time, uh, you know, no one can really it, it's really it's a lot harder to pin you down than uh, you know some of these uh, some of these higher levels where you know there there may be like you know you may live in the same place for a few weeks or a month or or or, or whatever. Uh, so before you before you actually you know build a stationary home uh, or you know a tent or, or whatever whatever you decide uh, you know to, to to call a home. Uh, you got to have that competency first, and uh, then you can start, you know, increasing activity, which would be, you know, like uh, uh, setting up a, a temporary house, uh, for example. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, if if people want to kind of learn more about uh, some of these things, they they might need to wait for some episodes, or maybe see if they can. Uh, well, I mean, read Rayo's book at least at least to get your feet wet before we make said episodes. But yeah, I mean, this is. There again, like much like Rayo said, Vanu is not an all or nothing thing. There is a spectrum here, and it is, and it is yours for the making. So, uh, so we're we're kind of laying out a foundation here, and then once once you kind of get understanding and and you start to become uh, more adept in in, in the strategy of Vanu, I mean, hell, well, m make it yourself, and then let us know how it goes. So we definitely we definitely appreciate that. So D level, uh, essentially that of you know the the tiny house of fishing and autos. So. Uh, so I guess the best way to put this is, I mean, you know, you, you have a, a small house, you know, s s things that are smaller are easier to conceal than, uh, than, you know, uh, larger ones. It's a, so it's a lot easier to, you know, uh, hide a, a log cabin in the woods versus, you know, uh, a house in, or a, a house or an apartment in Chicago. Right. Uh, so yeah. I, I think that just kind of goes without saying, but, uh, I, I guess I, I don't have any much else on, on, on D level. It's just, it's kind of your first step to. You know, building a, a stationary home or or living stationary for, I guess, uh, for, for the start of your Vanu journey, so to speak. Not necessarily, because remember, some of the tiny homes can actually fit on trailers. And True. Some of the okay. Tiny... Yes. Yes. I, actually, let me, so let me, actually, let me, no. Oh, yeah. Yes. That's you're let, half let me, right. let me pause it this real quick though, because I saw and this was a really, really badass invention. Um. So that yeah, there was a little a little uh, there was a like a tiny home. That you could fit on a trailer and still had the amenities, like you could still hook up Wi-Fi to it and things. So like you could just park anywhere in the middle of the woods, uh, and, like wherever wherever the hell you wanted your home to be. And it had like uh, you know a couch, a bed, like you know the the amenities that uh, um, some of us, most of us, probably have become accustomed to. Uh, it's just a lot smaller environment. Yes, and so when it comes to D level, which would approximate that of 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 the tiny house people and so forth, you know it it it. It is true that now you're seriously getting into like more uh, uh, sh shelters that are more like structures, more typical structures of one kind or another. And but still, it's it's a spectrum, ladies and gentlemen, because some of the tiny houses, yeah, do have firm foundations that are rooted in the soil, much like a typical building, like like a stereotypical log cabin, like Shane just said. But, you know. You know, they're the ones that fit on the trailers. So even then, mobility is kind of a, well, maybe it's there, maybe it's not. Also consider one other thing, too. Even if you make a tiny home that is rooted to the soil and it's got a foundation, it's basically, just think, stereotypical log cabin, okay? What rule, wait, wait for it, what law says that you are only allotted one of these? Why not have a network of them if you can afford to do so? There's some food for thought. Mm. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, anything else on that, or, or should we go to E-level? This is where things get real interesting, in my opinion. 
I'd say this, if you people don't want to, you know, fall into the consumerist trap of 30 year mortgages and all that, but you still want to have something re representing like what you would think of as a stereotypical home, but like an affordable one, consider a tiny house or two or three. Oh yeah. There, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So E-level. Uh, now Kyle, you wrote a, uh, uh, you wrote a, a, you wrote a fictional little story, uh, an Agoras anecdote a little while ago. And, uh, uh, you know, E-level would be like a small workshop, uh, um, uh, like uh, your character Rebecca and her hidden bedchamber within the nondescript garage located amongst the rest of that industrial park. Uh, so I just want you to tell the listeners just a little about that uh, real briefly. Sure. And, you know, yeah, I know it, it was it was a work of fiction, but actually I did base it off a real life thing that I actually saw with my own eyes and such. OK, and I don't want to reveal uh, who it was or what happened, although although maybe it's worth mentioning at a later time when we get into the sailboat issue, because there actually is a connection there, by the way. Uh, but regarding this specifically, yeah, um, there is basically a guy I knew who has since gone uh, really off the radar, not just off grid, but like I can't get in contact with him kind of thing. And he prepared me ahead of time. And basically, long story short, at uh, he was a car mechanic. He lived at a car, uh, you know, a, basically he was a very uh, independent entrepreneur, let's put it that way, okay? And he would refurbish cars, and that's kind of how he made his living. Well, he had this kind of nondescript garage and all that, but because he, well, let's just say there were certain uh, apartment corporations and trade unions that didn't exactly like uh, a certain record of his too much because they don't like, you know, you know, if you don't pass certain checks and background checks of one kind or another, because, well, let's just say you got caught with a little black market activity and leave it at that. Okay. <laughs> uh, they don't, they won't approve the lease contracts. So what do you do for shelter? Well, he thought, well, why don't I just live at work? You know, it, he owned the place already. He didn't have to bow or scrape before anybody. He got a stupid background check to get a freaking apartment. So his solution basically was, why not just, you know, convert a small portion of that garage into basically a livable working area? So Rayo's notion of like the hidden bed chamber, which is what he called it, uh, is literally what this uh, unnamed fella that I knew uh, actually did. So this is not theoretical. This is not some pie in the sky thing. And, you know, the only thing I regretted, Shane, is that with the relatively short time I had with him, I wish I would have asked him more details on it, but going strictly so I could tell people in more detail all these years later. But what I can definitely tell you for certain is that there was a cordoned off section of the garage where it didn't quite look like a shipping container, but it was kind of similar, arguably. It was kind of like a uh, segregated, like, office type area. But it had plumbing. It had electricity. Um, he converted one of the rooms to like a bedroom. It wasn't very big. It's probably a little bit larger than a tiny house because this garage was kind of on the larger side, okay? Because he had like, you know, seven to ten cars in there, okay? And in different stages of, you know, disassembly, right? Different clients he had. Um, but how do I say this? It it kind of was like a typical apartment in, in, in a lot of ways. So he was essentially trying to recreate an apartment within this garage, but it was more like a hidden bedchamber. And so when I wrote that fictional story, uh, my the, the protagonist basically kind of had that type of, of thing, which is how she was able to Vanu in the cities. Mm -hmm. So actually, yes, it's a fictional example I gave, but it was actually based on a real world thing that I actually saw with my own eyes and heard with my own ears and so forth. And I, I knew the guy, but he was uh, he's a very, very private man, always was, probably always will be. And so that's why I'm not mentioning his name here. But yeah, he actually did this kind of thing. And my only regret is I didn't ask him more details about that, although we did talk about a lot of other things. But yeah, he, I mean, that's what I'm saying, folks. When it comes to Vanu or Agorism or a lot of this other stuff we talk about, it's not just pie-in-the-sky theoretical fluff, as some people would derisively call it. A lot of this is real-world practical, and much of it is efficacious things that I've either lived through or known people who have done this stuff. Indeed, indeed. Well said. Yeah, well said. it's real. But a lot, of, but a lot of people are stuck within the servile society with their thirty-year mortgages and their nine-to-five just over brokes and everything, else, and all the stuff related to that. And so, yes, we're trying to present. I'm trying to present, and Jane is here too, trying to present these different ways of being. With you know, trying to encourage you to have lifestyle changes so you can be invulnerable to coercion. And frankly, this is an interesting way, especially for those of you who are convicted felons. 
and I mean the nonviolent ones, like you guys are basically like former political prisoners, okay? If for whatever reason you can't get an apartment or whatever, or a mortgage for or or even for those of you who aren't convicted felons, this is another option too to get you off the streets. Indeed, yeah, and it's a, certainly certainly an interesting idea, and, and not everyone you know can uh, you know is, is capable, uh, and not I mean some people you have become acclimated to certain lifestyles, you know, uh, you know the 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 again the amenities that that uh, I mean some of us have gotten used to, so you know uh, bonding in cities like uh, like what uh, like what uh, the guy used to know did. Uh, that's a, that's another real option for for the folks who are like, oh, so if I Vanu, if I'm gonna like become a Vanu and I have to go live in the woods, oh shit, this doesn't sound like it's for me. Well, uh, again, it's on it's on a spectrum, uh, and Vanu is yours for the making. And uh, you know, there is such a thing as Vanu in cities, which uh, again we'll get into uh, in a later episode. <clears throat> but let's get on to uh, F level here because this is where things get interesting. Well, even more interesting than they haven't <laughs> been yet. But uh, so it, it, it's similar to the E level, you know, the uh, hidden bed chamber, but it's larger. So I'll provide a short quote by Rayo here. Quote, construct hidden soundproofed apartments and workshops beneath or within an owned building, ostensibly used for other purposes. Since such chambers could be blast, fire, and fallout resistant, this approach offers some protection against the nuclear attack as well as day-to-day -day predation, end quote. Uh, now, just as far as that last one, the nuclear attack, uh, he was kind of a, <laughs> uh, consider the time, uh, the time period. Uh, he was a little worried about that. Uh, I think around the time of the Cold War, right? I think it yes, was. Yeah. Yes, yes, it was. And, but but also consider, just as a slight note, and kind of you know going back to, of course, what Vano is defined as and distinguishing that out from uh, survivalism or being a retreatist and all that, you can kind of see here that Rayo is kind of backsliding a little bit, just a, just a wee bit. But hey, look, I mean, the guy was a friggin' pioneer doing stuff ahead of his time. If he's going to backslide every once in a while, there's other portions in the book, too, where he's worried about nuclear incineration, for example, which is why he was considering, like, regarding import-export activities, maybe you should, like, quote-unquote, commute to work and live in the van while your loved and be in the cities for, like, a week or whatever while your loved ones are out in the woods. So at least they don't get risk, you know, nuclear incineration was what I think he kind of phrased it as. So yeah. that is something else, folks, just a little bit of a side note. You'll notice about the book, Rayo was concerned about uh, nuclear attacks, uh, by foreign powers and probably the Soviet Union, more likely than not, um, and all that. So, but I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call that, I, w I wouldn't necessarily call that backsliding into, you know, the survivalism thing, though, because, uh, I mean, you know, Vani is a, a lifestyle change, and that's just another thing he's preparing against. Right. Uh, so, so I wouldn't necessarily call it backsliding. I would just consider, you know, I mean, now we look at it as an irrational, as a, kind of an irrational fear because there hasn't been a nuclear war yet, right? Uh, but but he didn't he couldn't foresee the future. I mean the the way he right. foresaw the future it was a possibility. And I mean it's not out of the realm of possibility today. But I mean I don't think I don't think it's uh, I don't think it's very possible or wise. Uh, you know what uh, the 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 uh, those who falsely imagine themselves to be our rulers have to uh, you know they have to have the uh, the tax cattle and to you know kill off that many at once. Uh, it's probably not a wise idea. But anyways anyways. So there's what we're at, Rayo had to say about uh, about F level. So let, let's make this a little more concrete here. So like uh, a non vanu nightclub warehouse structure with, uh, yeah, an underground, underground apartments, factories, etc. I want to provide an example here, you know, uh, you know, a pop culture example. So uh, I, I'm sure some of you have seen the show Breaking Bad. And uh, obviously whenever, uh, uh, whenever, the, uh, whenever they start uh, cooking for Gus, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the, the guy who uh, had the, uh, the uh, uh, chicken restaurant, the fast food chicken restaurant as a front for his, his illegal drug business. Yeah, that could, you know, that could be, you know, that's, that's definitely, definitely Vanu. Uh, have a front to, you know, launder the money and all that good stuff. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, uh, if, if you recall, whenever you know, they started cooking for him, uh, there was a, a large warehouse. Uh, it was a, a laundromat. I mean, you know, washers, dryers, uh, a, lot of, you know, a, lot of, a lot of employees. It was a pretty, pretty massive operation. And uh, uh, you know, whenever some you know washer and dryers, they 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 uh, they I pushed I, I think I pushed a button or something, and they like lifted up, and it, it revealed, you know, an, a hidden area with like uh, the, the like the best meth cooking station ever. I don't that's I don't that's relative. I don't I've never seen a meth cooking station, but uh, you know it was a really intricate you know design, and that was hidden within that warehouse. Uh, and whenever you know the DEA agents came there, and they you know they looked, they were following up on leads, they couldn't find anything because I mean. <laughs> How are they going to find a, like a button like that? I mean, they're going to they're, they're going to look for what's in plain sight. Uh, so that that was a very very good you know F level uh, operation there. 
uh, now, uh, obviously, uh, with with your Vani, uh, with your Vani F level uh, infrastructure, you can do what you want to. But that's just one example from pop culture uh, that uh, you guys might be familiar with, and can can kind of point to that as an example of, of what Ray was kind of discussing here. Yeah, um, I I think that's more than fair. I, or to go for the folks who are more, uh, you know, comic uh, comic book uh, geeks or cartoon aficionados, uh, how about the friggin' Batcave? and a Batman, the Batcave. <laughs> okay, um, I, I think that would probably be fair to say it's probably more akin to F level. I mean, you think about the friggin' Batcave, that place was invulnerable to coercion for the, well, of course, except, you know, occasionally every once in a while there'd be like a, uh, somebody from the rogues gallery who would figure out, aha, I go in through this access port and I can be in the Batcave, and sometimes they'd remember he, even though he was Bruce Wayne, and other times they wouldn't, and then they were like, but if they did figure out he was Bruce Wayne, then they would get conked on the head and then forget that Bruce Wayne was Batman and so forth, and blah, 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 okay. But the point is, that it was that, except for those occasionally intrusions by a lot of the villains, or at least some of them, the Batcave was pretty invulnerable to coercion for the for, for the most part. I mean, it's pretty impressive what Bruce Wayne mm -hmm. did with the place. So I would say that, yeah, the Batcave would also be another fictional example of, of something kind of along the lines of like an F-level um, venuum. Yes, and again... I mean, these are fictional examples, and they're they're pretty they're pretty large scale. I mean, a huge million million billion millions and millions of dollars worth of you know meth being sold that was cooked in that location, and then the Batcave, another you know comic book uh, um, fictional example. But uh, I mean, th these are these are very very these are pretty intricate ones. Uh, now you know just uh, you know industrial warehouse, and uh, you can find you know uh, um, you know. Uh, an entrepreneur who uh, won't ask questions and or or whatever. I mean, there there are a lot of ways to go about this. Uh, but I mean, you know, underground warehouses, uh, factories, you know, just apartments, uh, or just a place for you to live. I mean, there there are a lot of possibilities, uh, and these are obviously intricate examples. But they're you know supposed to solidify, uh, you know, something concrete for you to to point out and say, okay, that's F level. Uh, so so let's move forward to G level now. Uh, I guess. God, the best thing that I guess we could come up with for this is you know like a syndicalist radical trade union factory. Uh, you know, if they could find a way to hide everything. Uh, I I don't know about this one, but I, I mean, kind of grasping at straws here, but but I, I guess, do, do you want to kind of speak to that? Um, yeah, I can take a swing at what would probably be G-level or or something approaching, I guess, light industry, perhaps. Um, mainly, I, I would say mainly this, for the listeners to at least kind of conceptualize this far out. I think there were either really large-scale bunkers or types of factories that the Soviets would hide in, like, deep ravines. And that's, like, the closest thing I can really think to, to, like, a Vanus quasi-syndicalist, you know, radical trade union factory type thing. It's kind of like what the Soviets actually did. Um, and so forth. And so whether it be a bunker or whether it's a factory hidden in a ravine or versions or themes thereof, I don't know. I would also say this, just as an alternate idea, or maybe I shouldn't say this publicly, but what the hell. Um, if people could like figure out like how to, mm, you know how the syndicalists are kind of like more militant types who kind of like want to live on top of each other with their voluntary collectivism and so forth. Uh -huh, and yeah. it's very militant. 20, it's not. It's not like a more of a mutualist situation where um, they each have their own, you know, shelters or whatever, but then they come together to the commons, if you will, you know, the Agora to do their trading and then they go back home and whatever, but they're like living on top of each other 24 seven. Well, I think this example was used. I think, I think I heard you mention this, I think in an earlier episode somewhere, uh, but like the notion of, well, living on a submarine. So if you have a bunch of people living in a submarine and preferably like submerged, I uh, guess maybe that, that would count ooh. as G level. Ooh, that that's yeah, that's that yeah. If, if it's like a, a decent size, you know, submarine, and uh, I mean, I, I don't know, I don't necessarily know how this would work, but if you've got like uh, if you like uh, you know surface, and then like you just like release some boats to get import export. Yeah, that would that, that that's actually not not a bad example at all, if, as long as it was large enough to be you know, uh, you know, light industry or, or, or something along that lines. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I think that's actually a very interesting way that you put it about how import export work as well. Um, 
So, and obviously the submarine would be more mobile than, say, the factory hid in the ravines or a bunker, oh, right? Yes. Oh, yes. So, oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. So, hey, you know, if the syndicalists were serious about, well, their syndicalism, they could even practice Vanu, too, if they were really serious. But come on, how many syndicalists have friggin' submarines? And how many of them are serious? <laughs> no, no, they oh, would rather gosh. block traffic at the friggin' Portland, Oregon with their stupid block block nonsense. Oops. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's that, we, a discussion for another time. But yeah, that, that's an interesting idea, too. It's still out in the water, but, you know, uh, and then you're, you're, you're uh, underneath it in a dry, uh, dry atmosphere. Huh. Interesting, interesting. So, well, let's move on to H level here. Uh, so, we mentioned this in the last episode, uh, so we won't go as, into as much depth here, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, Aurora and Alongside Night. Uh, this would be, you know, a heavy industry, uh, heavy, heavy industry. I mean, it was like a mall. Uh, uh, you know, uh, that was, was a, a mall volume. Like, it was very, very, very secure. There were only warning systems, and uh, they definitely had an invulnerability to coercion uh, while trading and living. Uh, so, in, in other words, they had their secure home bases. Uh, now, again, as we kind of mentioned, you'd, <laughs> you'd have to get that capability first before you increase your activity to that level. Um, but that would be an example of, uh, of H level. So, uh, what are your thoughts, Kyle? Yes, I, I think that's definitely one way of putting it. I don't know. It's it's just kind of like, sorry, I don't mean to sound like a party pooper here. H level is so far out. Like, I mean, this is presuming that uh, that folks can even, not even so much conceptualize, but make happen, you know, uh, G level, F level, even to some degree E level. Right, because, okay, if we talk about tiny houses, everyone knows what a freaking tiny house is, okay, for anybody who's actually been, uh, you know, consuming alternative media uh, for any real length of time. Or, or, even, point, or even mainstream media, to be completely honest. Sure. Okay, generally speaking, just about anybody now in the in the year of our Lord 2017 knows what a friggin' tiny house is, okay? But then once you start going from E-level up, now we're getting into structures that are quite... Um, Elaborate. Large. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, there's this. It's not even so much the mobility issue, although there's that too. It's more just the sheer, yeah, you're right, the sheer size of it. Like, I mean, it's really kind of getting up there that it's even hard to even conceptualize or, or, you know, even think about, much less actually put it together. Now, having said that, Thankfully, if we go to fiction, we can actually find examples that we can at least sink our teeth into. And so, yes, I would say probably more likely than not, something like Aurora would be an example of of an H level uh, Venuum. Um, well, what about what about Gold's Gulch? Yeah, because of the um, oh g- gosh, hold on, I'm gonna have to try and remember this. It's been a while since I've looked at the uh, Atlas Shrugged. Um, the shielding, the, the high tech inexplicable yeah, yeah, yeah. shield John Galt had. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, I mean, that's, that's deception, isn't it? Right. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. Concealment too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So yeah, Galt's Gulch would absolutely be, and remember Galt's Gulch was privately in that fictional novel. It was owned by Midas Mulligan. Right. So the entire thing was private property. Um, but yeah, that place was so huge. With multiple buildings, it stretched over so many acres and so forth, somewhere in Colorado, I think it was, um, that, yeah, it might as well be H-level, because that's, I mean, I mean, I mean, let me put it this, okay, let me make this a little bit more concrete. You know how people talk about private cities? Uh-huh. Private cities with its own private roads, with its private sidewalks, and private, 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 okay, you want to talk about a real H-level? It's a friggin' private city. That's what the hell it is. Hmm, Okay. Okay. Yeah, because I, I you, agree with that. Well, because if you look at G level, and we're talking, you know, just just compare and contrast here. For at G level, if we're talking something ranging from factories to submarines to things that are kind of large, but they're not like huge and sprawlingly expansive, but it's still kind of somewhat contained in a sense. Then G level with something like a factory or a submarine, things more on that scale. That's one thing. But then once you get to H level, hell, we're talking private cities at that point, aren't we? Just yeah. And and again, to go back to Aurora, Aurora might as well have been an underground private city, by the way, mm-hmm. for those of you who actually understand that particular example. Yeah, no, I I, I definitely agree. I definitely agree. And I think you made a good point. You know, that's uh, it's, it's kind of hard to conceptualize because nothing really like that uh, has, has come to fruition. I mean, even when Rayo kind of started with like the uh, 
uh, the Free Isles project. I mean, that could that would be considered age level two if it would have come into fruition. But again, we we probably wouldn't have wanted it if that would have come into fruition. So uh, I, I I don't know. I I guess it, it's definitely very hard to conceptualize, and I, I think that that it's good to bring that to 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 attention as far as like laying out uh, meantime to harassment. But uh, obviously, I think the the focus should be you know like uh, levels uh, A through F. Uh, but that's just, you know, my subjective opinion and, and kind of also looking at, you know, what's, uh, I guess, looking at it pragmatically, too, although not like the uh, not like the uh, political crusading pragmatists, as they call themselves. Uh, yeah, I think those are the, those are the most pragmatic ones. And, and I don't think they'd be too complex either. Uh, they, they aren't something intricate like uh, uh, like Aurora or like Gold's Gulch. They're just, uh, you know. It's a lot easier to, you know, kind of consider like, okay, so if I was going to do this, uh, what steps would I take and, and what are some things to consider? You can actually kind of figure out, okay, so if I was going to, you know, do, uh, uh, if I was going to do, uh, you know, E-level, uh, all right, so, you know, I can, I can look into, you know, I can look into, you know, a building that, uh, that could, I could purchase or, or, or whatever. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, the bedchamber, uh, how, would I, how would I conceal that? Okay, what would I need? All right. Uh, how would I deal with import export? Okay, okay, interesting. Uh, and you can kind of, you know, kind of methodically, or method, yeah, methodically, kind of walk through these things. Whereas with like, uh, with even even like a G and H level, maybe even F two, uh, but F F could be con conceptualized. But like G and H level, it's just so hard to. <laughs> okay, so I want to set up a private city. How do I do that? Um. Hmm. Yeah, exactly. And <laughs> kind, so, kind of hard. <laughs> and so, yeah, and I, I, I know I've, I've kind of been accused of, you know, of trying to become the master of low expectations, but perhaps that accusation might be coming true as, as time goes on. I don't know for certain. I'll leave that up to the judgment of other people who maybe who can maintain at least a little bit of objectivity. I would just say this. I'd be happy if people could even like get good at a level. Okay, yeah. I'm not joking. People have a really, especially these friggin' city rats, man, have a really hard time with the notion of sleeping out underneath the stars. Like, like not bad weather, but like decent weather where it's not too cold, not too hot, okay? But like sleeping out under the stars, okay? I I'm not saying go be homeless. What I'm saying is like go camping without a tent. Like start, you know, with something like friggin' achievable that doesn't take a lot of money. And doesn't take a lot of time. It yeah, doesn't then, put then, you and at then risk. Also, and then also, too, like, I think you're right. You know, A-level would be great because, you know what, uh, Vonnie fosters other Vonnie. So uh, once once someone becomes comfortable with A-level, I mean, there, there's only really one way to go. I mean, uh, I mean, obviously, uh, they're going to want to become, I mean, I'm not speaking for other people. I'll say, you know, for me, like, if I, if I could achieve A-level, uh, you know, I, how, how far can I take this damn thing? Let's see. Let's find out. Uh, right. You know, I, I I try to become more proficient, and I try to you know increase my activity, you know, in accordance with uh, uh with maintaining volume and, and and hopefully even increasing it. Uh, so so I think you know like uh, you know an achievable goal, A level. Let's go with A level, and then uh, hell, I mean that's uh, uh yeah, volume fosters fosters other volume. Yeah, and like look for a lot of people, I think I would agree with Rayo on this. Pretty much once they get to D level you're going to see a lot of people start adopting it really quickly because the first three levels, let's be honest, are really going to be only attracted to people who are more of a, and I mean this in a good sense, but more of like a gypsy mentality well, because it, they are that's, so that's, highly mobile. That's that's for the pioneers, those who those who want freedom so bad. They want to find the freedom so bad that they will do almost anything. Um, yeah. They're for the, the really hardcore hardcore folks. Yeah, and I would agree with, with, with Rail that, that, you know, Somebody actually has to work their way up to D level before it starts, you know, seeming, you know, like halfway plausible, even to other people, like in the sense of like role modeling and such. And for a lot of, and let me also be honest about something else. If quite a few people achieved D level, even if they worked their way up from A to B to C and so forth, I think a lot of people honestly would just stop at D level, to be perfectly frank with you. Just because like, okay, I now have my, my tiny house. I'm done. I'm going to go do other things with my life. And honestly, I think a lot of people would just be that way. Now, me personally, I would die a very happy man if I could thoroughly master, uh, I think it would probably be E-level to the extent where I could probably, to the extent where my MTH is going to be greater than 10 years, right? Because the minimum area of profitability for E-level is, is, is 10 years. Uh, and, that, that's, and obviously that's your small workshop. So, like, that, I would like to get that up to where it's 100 years. 
And, you know, if I could do that, I would die a very, very happy man. Um, but also consider something else, too. Maybe not so much F level, although that's kind of debatable, but definitely G and absolutely H level. Once you start getting into light and heavy industry, you kind of need other people, don't you? Yes. Yes, that is true. Yeah. So <laughs> when, right, so A through, excuse me, at least A through D level competency, you can just do that stuff on your own. You don't need a group. You don't need other people. You don't, you don't even need a freedom cell. OK, you can do it if you want, but if push comes to shove, you don't need even a freedom cell to do that stuff. You just don't. No, you, you don't even you don't even need a freemate. I mean, yeah, you can you can you can you can decide to, you know, uh, go down and go down, you know, A through D level. I mean, obviously, you, know, you got to work, work up, work up that competency. But uh, I mean, yeah, you, you could start that like you, you make the decision. You can start that tomorrow. There's nothing stopping you. Right. Now, for for those higher ones, uh, again, you got to work up to those. But even if you had that competence competence level already, you still got to have other people. And as I know, uh, you know, some of the ANCAPs have uh, have found out, uh, and just anarchists more generally, it's very very hard to uh, you know uh, get people to uh, uh, get status and and those within the servile society to you know be attracted to anything that's not outside of their you know their status paradigm. So uh, uh, so that's that's also kind of something else to consider that I, I know most of you are probably familiar with. Yeah, and I think Rayo said some of the effect of something like an E level would be the minimum. Correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think he said that the that an E level would be the minimum level of competency to have any sort of alternate economy worthy of the name. I True. think it was E level. So I that's so. why I'm saying for me, E level would be kind of my, you know, shining thing. So at least we can start trading. That way we can actually start building a second realm and all of that, which is what I care about. Um, but then again, that's me. I mean, I do, hey, to be perfectly honest, folks, yes, I'm an individualist, but I do have my groupy tendencies. Okay, I admit it, mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa, okay? That's on me. I would just say this. When you get to F level, uh, yeah, I, you're probably going to have to involve people with F level just because of the scale issue. Be uh, sorry. How can you? I mean, I guess you could have a bat cave all by yourself, but it doesn't seem really likely. You're gonna at least have other people at least help you at least make it, if not necessarily run it. And yeah. e and e level, e level conceptual. Yeah, it would take quite a bit of work, but you could do it on your own if if you if you really were willing to put in the time and you didn't really do too much else, at least for a little bit. But definitely mm -hmm. a through d, definitely a through d, you can do on your own for a lot of people now. There's also the issue of preference. A lot of people wouldn't want to be homeless by themselves. If they're going to be homeless, they would rather be homeless with like a couple of other people they trust, ideally. Same thing with bugging out, same thing. Hell, a lot of couples are van are, are do the van dwelling thing. So they're they're at like C level, okay? And you could arguably say the same thing about the tiny house people at D level. So a lot of times those are couples doing that. So yeah, suffice it to say, man. When you look at the different competencies for mean time to harassment, there is quite a bit of a spectrum. It Vanu again to reiterate the point, Vanu is not an all or nothing thing. There is a spectrum here. Indeed, indeed. So well, let's let's begin to wrap this up here. I think the first thing I want to mention is that you know when it comes to direct action, Vanu is is direct action. What counts matters uh, if it's actually direct action or not, and obviously anything political crusading. Uh, uh, or you know, collective movementism as as Rayo defined it, uh, uh, or yeah, as as we've defined it, uh, I guess uh, <laughs> yeah, what what counts matters, uh, and also the efficacy matters. It really matters if it, if if this if this action is you know uh, efficacious towards meeting the ends of more freedom. That's crucial uh, because it you know it could save a lot of time, uh, and unfortunately, how people are you know wasting time on inefficacious means. I guess that, that that is one that's one reason that you know Rayo came up with MTH, uh, you know, to try to gauge the efficacy of Vanu. And this isn't just like uh, okay, is this method you know uh, is this is this method you know efficacious? Yes, no. Okay, move on to the next one. This is you know uh, like different strategies of Vanu, uh, engaging whether whether it's worth your time and whether it's worth your money. Any, any I guess any any closing thoughts for you? I know there are a couple a couple a couple other points we wanted to mention uh, in closing, but uh, I'll, I'll kind of leave it to you here for for a moment. Well, yeah, it, for those for those folks who take a look at, you know, our website, vanupodcast.com, I think one of the logos was like the little log cabin mm -hmm. icon, I think. Well, obviously, that's D-level, isn't it? So, you know, I'm, I'm trying to point that, again, as Rayo said, 
function determines form, means determine ends. How you achieve something is also just as important as to where you end up. And if people don't take that into consideration, then of course you're going to have all of these really nasty consequences, like when you do when people do their political crusading routine, and then lo and behold, their principles get diluted and they don't even achieve their so-called public policy ends. It's like, well, you weren't being consistent. And oh, by the way, as is relevant to this particular episode, you weren't even trying to measure how what, the the uh, the efficacy the effectiveness of your purported methods of things like suing the government and voting and protesting and petitioning and grassroots lobbying and on and on and on relative to achieving whatever those so-called public policy ends are of whatever the hell it doesn't really matter what specific ones we're talking about uh, as opposed to meantime and harassment which actually is serious about gauging the direct action methods that that vanu is is really all about Indeed, indeed. And I, I don't mention that. I want to mention this again. You know, just full full disclosure. I mean, I I, I don't feel ashamed by this. There's no reason to feel ashamed by this. But so yeah, obviously we had to fill in some blanks to you know reasonably attempt to guess uh, what types of Vanu shelters, uh, or in some instances, you know, with like A through C, you know, not really shelters. Uh, what if those would be indicative of minimum profitable viability uh, in terms of mean times to mean time to harassment? Uh, now Rail gave us some hints, but uh, we did have to reason it out. And uh, this is not in set in stone, and we'll likely update it later on when we discuss, uh, you know, actions solely. And again, you know, uh, when, uh, for example, when Kyle initially published the MTH article, uh, there was a mistake in there. And uh, we had to fix it for this episode, and we'll get that updated uh, on the Vani website uh, here too very soon. Uh, so, I mean, that, that's just going to happen when we're going through this, because I mean, unfortunately we can't give Rayo a call on Skype and ask him for clarification, which is not possible. <laughs> so, so I mean, just kind of, kind of bear with us, and if we make mistakes, we'll obviously admit it. I mean, there's, no, there's no, it's nothing nothing to be ashamed of. It's not like... Uh, I can message Derek Bros and ask him a question on Freedom Cells, right? Uh, but I can't, you know, uh, yeah, I can't call Rayo on Skype and, you know, ask him to, would this be considered a d-level shelter i you, we just can't do that so please bear with us as we as we kind of flesh this out in our minds and also kind of relay that relay relay that to you guys so right and I'll, and everybody also keep in mind like just just regarding myself like i'm the first publicly known vanuist in over four decades okay so yes much like shane said if there's like an innocent mistake that uh, that that's cropped up uh for whatever reason you know please understand there's some things we're trying to kind of make sense of from the record that Rayo left us. And, you know, sometimes we're not going to get 100% right, but then if there was an error on our part, we'll you know, obviously try to self-correct, right? That That's part of the free market, right? Uh, is is that self-corrective, you know, function and all that. Indeed, indeed. So so I guess the, the, there is a question that uh, we, we kind of thought of when we were preparing for this uh, that, that uh, we, we will probably revisit in a future episode, uh, and that is uh, that is this. What counts as harassment in meantime to harassment? You know, what would the harassment question be a visit by the bludgies, letters from the government, surveillance drones? Uh, not really sure. Um, obviously, the, like those would be, you know, harassment generally. But as far as, you know, um, what Rayo was kind of getting at with MTH, we'll have to kind of explore that further. It'll probably be in season three because season two will be, you know, season one is looking at, you know, the section one theory uh, of what Rayo said. Section two or uh, season two will be, uh, you know, looking at uh, uh, section two of his book and trying to uh, you know, or kind of re relaying to you guys what what he thought to be you know efficacious means of, uh, of Vanu, uh, and also what he what he kind of learned. And then season three is where we're, we're going to kind of expand upon these things. And uh, I mean, this whole thing is going to be interesting, and I hope you guys find it that way. But season three is going to be incredible. I could already tell you that right now. We we've, we've been uh, talking about Vanu for oh hell, it's been almost uh, almost a year now, Kyle. Almost a year. Uh, so yeah, we've got a lot of ideas and a lot of things we want to share with you. Uh, so definitely, you know, kind of, uh, uh, hopefully you're enjoying it. Hopefully you're not just like, okay, I'm going to keep listening, but God, get to season two, season three already. Uh, <laughs> I understand that, but we got to lay this foundation first. Uh, and obviously, you know, uh, um, the, the, the action of Vani would make a whole lot of sense without mean time to harassment. Uh, and obviously the justification for, you know, uh, uh trying to achieve Vani. Uh, so with that said, Kyle, any closing thoughts? I would say this, it, that, that ending question about what counts as harassment in MTH, I think is, very, is a very valid question that obviously we'll, we'll, get, we'll explore later. But between now and then, you know, hey, you know, listeners, you want to email me, kyle at vanupodcast.com. Why don't you suggest to me what you think of would probably be considered harassment 
especially in the context of mean time to harassment, because correct me if I'm wrong, Shane, I don't think Rayo ever defined what said harassment uh, was. No, he, he was very good with definitions, but I, I don't know if he just thought like he didn't need to define that or, or, or what it was. But, uh, but yeah, I, I think that's, that's definitely a valid question. Uh, and also just kind of, you know, I, I want to promote some interaction here. I mean, uh, you can find us on uh, on fascist book, uh, facebook.com forward slash Bonnie podcast, I think, or just search for the Bonnie podcast. Remember that URL again. I apologize. Uh, obviously, shoot us email Shane at Bonnie podcast dot com, Kyle at Bonnie podcast dot com. Uh, but yeah, get in contact with us. I mean, if you're finding this interesting, you have questions, if you want us to talk about something, I mean, I, Kyle, I'm not, I'm not adverse. Like if people have questions or wants to clarify something, I'm not adverse to, you know, state taking a step back. I mean, if there, if there's something, if, if you guys want to request something, just let us know and we'll, we'll definitely accommodate, uh, to, to, to fit as best as we can. Of course, of course. And, and obviously regarding the question of what counts as harassment, that was an open question because Rayo never defined it. So, you know, obviously, if, if, if y'all, the, the listeners and the audience and so forth, want to kind of help us further develop Vanu, uh, kind of like, you know, we, we've kind of uh, picked it up from where it was left off in 1974, and we're trying to, you know, at least explain it again and then further develop it here, uh, here now in 2017, um, regarding at least certain things, if, if not perhaps more, we could certainly use everybody's help. So here's the question to end out on. What counts as harassment at MTH? Please let us know what you think of what that harassment might take the form of. Precisely, precisely. I guess the last, the last closing thought I'll provide is, is that uh, you know Rayo didn't do this alone. I mean, he was you know in a lot of libertarian publications talking about this. Uh, the two that I remember off the top of my head are Zerny and Straken, uh, who kind of you know attributed to, or contributed to Vanu in some way. But unfortunately, there's nothing by them that I can find on the internet. Uh, so like this isn't Rayo didn't develop this all by himself. Yes, he's kind of you know kind of the the face behind the the strategy, and that's because of John Fisher's uh, John Fisher putting together that book. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, we we definitely love your assistance. I mean, the more folks, we, the the more great minds we have on this, the faster, uh, you know, we, we or I guess the, the the better we can develop this. Because Kyle and I, we we're, we're knowledgeable on the subject. We we definitely are. But you know, getting more minds on this wouldn't would definitely not be a bad thing. So. Uh, I think that's uh, that's all we have for you. Uh, the website, again, is vonnypodcast.com. Thanks so much for tuning in. We'll talk to you next week. Podcast.